Well, guys, um, I know we're pretty limited on time, so I'll just jump into it. Uh, my name is Troy, and I just want to say how thankful I am for being here and how uh, uh, grateful I am to have heard everybody so far. And I look forward to the rest of the presentations today. Uh, my presentation is entitled Dangerous Contradictions. It's on the ethos of non-tenure track faculty, um, though I'll be specifically talking about as the field of, in the field of composition studies. Um, it should have implications for um, how we treat uh, non-tenure track faculty in general. So my ultimate claim in this is going to be that non-tenure track faculty professionals are actually well positioned to enable critical attention in terms of their ethos. Over this, um, over this presentation, it's going to involve mostly unpacking what I mean by these terms. And then by the end of it, I can dig into some of the, the tension in my field. Um, so these terms that I'm going to be defining then are who are non-tenure track professionals, um, what does it mean to be well positioned, um, that's where I'm going to end up with contradiction. Um, critical attention itself I'm using as a technical term as part of a, an extension of the tradition of critical pedagogy. And then of course what ethos means. So, oh, uh, real quick, I, I do need to emphasize this point. No matter what I say in this presentation, I ultimately want this to be an argument for allyship and inclusion of non-tenure track professionals. I can't state that enough. That that's my beginning point and it will be my ending point as well. So who are non-tenure track faculty? Um, definitions vary across the field on uh, different studies and a lot of recent studies have come out. Um, but it's also in the popular imagination as well. Uh, the Atlantic has had at least three articles on this I think over the last five years. Um, but depending on the definition um, that I'm talking about in the, in the common sense term, um, professionals who are not on the track to tenure, which includes um, all faculty who are in contact with students, such as uh, people who are called part-timers, um, contingent adjunct laborers. Um, I'm a graduate student, and we all know what that's like as well, so we're partly included in some definitions and partly not. Um, the highest figures of which are 75% in some of these definitions, and of course the less inclusive definitions still yield about 50% of all faculty in contact with students are non-tenure track. Um, without job security, without health insurance, and other related benefits of that. Um, in my field specifically of composition, some institutions, especially community college and such, these part-timers uh, make up to 90% of those who teach students. So again, just part of uh, moving through definitions, uh, there are two goals for rhetoric and the fields of rhetoric and composition um, that have taken hold since the postmodern social turn. Um, in the new rhetoric uh, paradigm, we pay attention to critical awareness of the affects and effects of language on the embodied subject. So this is going to include attention to ideology, but just to unpack that. All I'm trying to say there is that um, language is constructed as epistemic, meaning you can't access the world or your ability to access the world depends on the language that you're using. The language functions in Kenneth Burke's terms as a terministic screens it selects, reflex, and deflects reality, different aspects of your reality that you can access based off of which language you're using. Um, part of this also in composition then is conscious attention to how language use enables access to different discourse communities, to different social formations. And again, removing the uh, complicated jargon. Um, if you just take your standard English 101 student, um, let's say a mechanical engineer, we're trying to pay attention to how the composition class um, enable such discourse as to let them go on from that class to enter into other mechanical engineering classes on a higher level. Right? How does language enable you to access other social communities that speak a language that you don't yet? So one recent trend in the field, for example, is uh, attention to transfer, um, how different language use allows you to do that. Um, when, I, when I was writing this presentation, I was assuming that I would have to define ideology <laughs> at some point, but this will be kind of useful because it gives a different perspective. This is going to sound like a summary at this point, though, um, more than anything else. Uh, so two quick points on it. What I'm, where I'm coming from with ideology um, is the cultural assumptions that make um, the unnatural seem natural. And Antonio Gramsci's uh, terms, it's the common sense or the sense that we all hold in common. The uh, unspoken assumptions that some of you have talked about. Um, how uh, We do know a couple things about it though, and some pieces that you all are familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, Louis Althusser's work on ideological state apparatuses tell us that ideology, these, these uh, unspoken cultural assumptions, they're carried through the social formations that we have already. 
Um, from that piece specifically, he not only tells us that, but also that the conditions whereby ideology is reproduced are also produced. So this is just to say, uh, this famous example, uh, what do children learn in school in that piece? It's not so much the reading, writing, and arithmetic that they carry with them, but it's more so that they learn to sit in a desk for eight to nine hours a day for five to six days a week. In other words, they learn how to be subjected to a discourse or to cultural assumptions in the first place, thus enabling the conditions whereby ideology is reproduced. Um, we also know that the language that you use, um, in, Michel, in Michel Foucault's terms, the knowledge power is carried through discourse itself, through the languages that you're using. So, um, and, and to bring back Luis Altazera, subjects are interpolated, the human um, is interpolated, they're given a role, but at the same time, their role is limited um, from operating outside of it, depending on which social formation you're entering into. Okay, and what this means for a teacher at the front of the classroom in composition. Um, I'm relying on, on Marx's uh, embodiment or conception of embodiment um, for this, but it's not only that um, the ethos of a teacher commonly understood as the credibility and in part rely and uh, relatability uh, for Kenneth Burke. It's not only that the ethos, and so we have the iceberg here, um, is dependent on the person in the front of the room teaching you all. It's that that person is a reflection of their social material history, their embodied history, right, at the front of the room. So the ethos of a, of a given teacher in a, on a given day depends on a lot of different factors, um, partly the social situation, but partly who they are and the role they take in their institution, what their institution has permitted them to um, take. So then one of the last definitions here on critical pedagogy, um, this is uh, drawn from the work of Paula Freire mostly, Freire uh, mostly. Um, the idea, and I have the definition there, um, students are enabled to tangibly change the world by drawing attention to the lived embodied situation. Um, again, just a concrete example, uh, Freire working with uh, farmers, teaching them how to read so they can negotiate crop prices. This is an education in a vacuum. It's in contrast to enlightened, enlightenment ideals of education. It's very much the opposite. It's that knowledge um, will allow you to tangibly change your world. And it's knowledge created in a specific social relationship at the time of the, right, where you are. So that means, of course, who the teacher is, again, is this embodied uh, material socioeconomic history. Um, and attention to that needs to be paid. And that's where uh, scholars such as Bell Hooks and Paula Freire have, have come in and helped uh, do that. So to get the crux of, of the problem in my field right now, um, and here we can start seeing resonances between uh, a lot of the constructions of self and other that were hinted at earlier throughout many of these presentations, is that there's been a pushback from scholars um, and what has been called a quote-unquote grassroots movement um, for scholars to sort of take back the discipline. And by scholars, I mean um, those who are not the part-time adjunct contingent graduate students, that we are on that, that track, um, depending on your definition. Um, though it has been a grassroots, grassroots movement for it um, and signaling of power, it actually leaves out adjunct faculty in that construction. Um, one particular work that does this is Dangerous Writing by Tony Scott, who I share so many sympathies with. If you actually read through the book, um, he comes from an adjunct position. He comes from talking about um, what it means as a graduate student to share an office with four other people and you have to talk to your students there um, and not have health insurance and you don't know if you're going to be able to make it to class and such. Um, but he, he defines this, this distinction between um, part-time, non-tenure track professionals and scholars in terms of bureaucrats and scholars. And he uses this as a reflection of their, their embodied practice. Bureaucrats are those uh, instructors who take orders, basically, from the writing program administrator. They're the English 101 instructor who's teaching five or six classes, and usually across town in some cases, so you don't have any time to work with your students. And you're basically um, operating on orders in his construction, um, whereas scholars have time to pay attention to critical awareness and such of, of discourse and et cetera, and, and your curriculum. He, he levies a more personal critique, which I find especially troubling, though, um, for, for bureaucrats, for us uh, part-timers, um, adjunct faculty. He says that we can't teach 
um, critical pedagogy effectively or from the right place because we lack a truly professional status in his terms. We lack uh, dignity. And in some sense, would if we're trying to teach this uh, critical pedagogy, we'd end up um, embarrassed in some sense. And I'm not misquoting, those are actually from the, the book. Though if you read it, you'll understand the, the sympathies I share with him because he's coming from, again, the place of having done the adjunct work and the, and the graduate. So when I, when I criticize him, I wanted it understood in terms of, I think he missed an opportunity. Um, because quite simply, there's a practical need. Um, the situation is such that there are so many non-tenure track faculty, constructing such an opposition isn't desirable in the first place. If we're going to change things, we need everybody on board, especially the majority of us on board with it. So for, I have a practical critique of it there. But as far as the theoretical goes, I think it's wrong. I think he's absolutely right about um, tying the teacher's embodiment in their capacity to teach. Of course, they're, of course they're related, right? Knowledge isn't created in a vacuum. Who you are as a teacher does reflect the content you teach. But how can our position of powerlessness be used to illuminate ideology better? Um, or in a more meaningful way, um, or non-arbitrary way, in other words, how is, how is our position as adjuncts better able to illuminate uh, neoliberal con concepts of education and hegemonic concepts of education. Um, one answer to this is that uh, from Victor Villanueva's Hegemony from an Organic uh, Grown in Intellectual, um, where he tells us that embodied contradiction itself as a person, of, and of course Victor Villanueva, uh, who I work with a lot at Washington State, um, his, his work has been in race and that from that marginalized position. Um, but I'm extending this to uh, the socioeconomic oppressed here. Um, and basically, the, the hege the hege sometimes you have to operate in these hegemonic ideals. Um, specifically, what I mean by neoliberal um, educational ideals here is that they, they emphasize what Chris Gallagher calls competency-based education. And this is the idea that knowledge is this, especially in a first-year composition class, because it underwrites most conceptions of writing. It's the idea that knowledge is neatly packaged, and you've got this skill that you can take with you to your other uh, spheres. But as I've been talking about, language isn't like that. Language shapes your world. You can't access it without some symbolic mediation. Um, so for Tony Scott, you're not able to do it that way. Um, but neoliberal education um, has it as the underlying assumption about what it means to gain knowledge in the first place. To gain knowledge in the first place. Um, and as such, um, in Scott's terms, ideology produces these irreconcilable contradictions, though whereas he takes it to mean that it's a contradiction so that um, the non-tenure track faculty can't um, effectively teach or they would be embarrassed to do so, lacking the dignity to do so. Uh, Villanueva's piece shows us that it's actually through that marginalized positionality um, that you can illuminate your situation to your students and, and that specific relationship between the powerless and the powerless, um, you can uh, effectively have some resistance towards, or at least shed light on the cultural assumptions underneath the, um, the education you're trying to, um, in critical pedagogy's case, uh, talk with through your students. So all this is to say that non-tenure track faculty embody such contradictions, but as much of this presentation is a, uh, an argument as to how they're able to do so, it's also a call to you all as educators um, that we need to draw such uh, attention in, in our classrooms. So I have this uh, abbreviation completely stolen from Victor Villanueva um, called COIC, C-O-I-K. Um, he just dropped this on us in a lecture, that guy's full of gems every now and then. Um, but it stands for conscious only if known. And this means that in your classrooms, when you're giving your content, when you're, when you're up there talking about whatever um, you, you're talking about that day, it's important to tell your story too. How you got there, what you're doing, and, and the conditions from where you're working. Otherwise, your marginalized position, the position of powerless, goes unknown in the student and that conversation never happens in the first place. The critical attention to the knowledge and skills that are so neatly packaged never gets troubled if you never share your story, if you never occupy an embodied position as a teacher. 
So again, um, it's just that, that contradiction of being a product of neoliberal education that enables you to have a better ethos, be more relatable to your student who also shares the same um, lack of power at that moment as well. Um, but in that, it's, it's got to be considered as, as a partnership. There's too many of us who are non-tenure track to leave a, a new faculty majority out of the equation. Um, this is just an image from a union. In Pennsylvania, for example, uh, we're over 90% of the faculty are on board. With it. And such movements, I believe, are the only, only meaningful way we can make change. Um, but it has to be with everybody in mind. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Troy. You definitely gave us a lot to think about, especially if you're a PhD student. So, um, to continue, we have Ricardo Frias. So, Ricardo is a third year PhD student in the philosophy department here at University of Oregon. He received his master's in English literature from California State University, Stanislaus. Did I say it right? Yeah? Sort of. <laughs> in 2014. Ricardo is the organizer of Health, Humanity, Body, and Society, which is a research interest group through the Oregon Humanities Center. And his research in philosophy focuses on early modern philosophy, 20th century French philosophy, Latin American history, and literature in general. His talk is titled Spinoza as the Devil, the, the Cynical Exegesis of History. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Troy, for the talk, and Mary as well. Um, I would like to echo that call, um, namely that if we want to do anything, um, one easy thing you can always do is form, well, one clear thing you can always do is form a union. So I'd like to express solidarity with the grad students striking right now at UCSC who are dealing with people pointing guns at them. 17 have been arrested as of yesterday um, as they call for a cost of living adjustment to pay their rent uh, and go to grad school. So um, this paper, uh, I had a lot of fun writing, which I think, like, I don't know, is what I want out of myself giving conference papers because everything else is sad and work. I mean, you know, I love education and stuff. Uh, glad to be here. Um, but I'm especially glad to be here, right? So this is really just a story about um, a philosopher very dear to my heart um, named Spinoza. Right? Uh, so uh, what you'll see on the screen, I just put uh, the paper itself in there, so if you wanted to try to follow along. I don't know how useful that is, but it's something I find myself wanting during conference talks. Right? I would have printed you a copy of but, but I didn't. So um, here's my, uh, my debt. Right, uh, I wrote it so it would be read as a conference presentation. Um, so I didn't put references in. I and mean, the real reason I didn't do that is because I'm lazy. But uh, I reference and quote uh, Beth Lord's book, Kant and Spinozism, Stephen Nadler's biography of Spinoza, and the wonderful Stanford Encyclopedia article that he also wrote, uh, Stuart's Courtier and the Heretic, countless works by Edwin Curley, including his collected works and translations of Spinoza. Edith Dahl's Weinstein's unique book, Spinoza's Critique of Religion and Its Heirs, Slaughterdyke's Critique of Cynical Reason, uh, Jonathan Israel's Radical Enlightenment, John Osman's, or Jan Osman's uh, Moses the Egyptian, and the iconic red cover, Marx Engels' Reader, right, which everyone should probably own a copy of at this point. So, his paper concerns the excommunicated Sephardic Dutch Jew philosopher Spinoza and the way in which he managed to horrify all of Europe for the next 300 years after his death with two academic works of philosophy. Uh, they were published anonymously, uh, or one after his death and the other anonymously, right? The first one's the ethics, the other one's the theological political treatise. So I'm distracting myself by the fact that the paper's here. here. <laughs> uh, uh, Spinoza's first name is alternatively uh, either Bento, his given name, Baruch in Hebrew, or Benedictus in Latin, although all three of them mean blessed. Uh, was born in 1632 in Amsterdam to a local Sephardic Jew congregation. And the Sephardic Jews uh, are Jews who lived in the Iberian Peninsula until 1492, right, a banner year uh, for Spain, when Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand issued the Alhambra Decree that ordered the expulsion of practicing Jews from Spain. And right after that, their expulsion from Portugal by King Manuel through decree. So in uh, 1656, Spinoza gripped his own uh, Decree, right? He was issued the most intense harem, which means ban or excommunication, 
ever given by the Sephardic community in Amsterdam. So it's unique in its intensity, as you'll see, uh, and in the fact that it was never rescinded. So Amsterdam's Ma'amad, which were the Council of Elders and Sephardic Communities, gave out 40 bands between 1622 and 1683. These bands varied in length from just one day and up to 11 years. So for Spinoza, it was very rare for a band to be permanent. So compare the text of the band that I'm going to read to you uh, of Isaac de Peralta, and this is what he did in 39. Right? He disobeyed and insulted the altars in the streets, and then apparently assaulted them. Uh, so this is his band. Taking into consideration that Isaac de Peralta disobeyed that which the aforesaid Mahamad had ordered him, and the fact that Peralta responded with negative words concerning this issue, and not content with this, Peralta dared to go out and look for them on the street and insult them, the aforesaid Mahamad, considering these things and the importance of the case, decided the following. Uh, he's excommunicated, he's declared Menuda, no one shall talk or deal with him. Right. Seems fair. So here's Spinoza's. The lords of the Mahamad, having long known of the evil opinions and acts of Baruch de Spinoza, have endeavored by various means and promises to turn him from his evil ways, but having failed to make amend his wicked ways, and on the contrary, daily receiving more and more serious information about the abominable heresies which he practiced and taught about, and his monstrous deeds, and having for this numerous trustworthy witnesses who deposed and bore witness to this effect, they became convinced of the truth of this matter, they've investigated, and in the presence of the Honorable Chachaman, they've decided with their consent that Spinoza should be excommunicated and expelled from the people. So, second page. By decree of the angels and the command of the holy men, we excommunicate, expel, curse, and damn Baruch de Spinoza with the consent of God, blessed be he, and with the consent of the entire congregation in front of the holy scrolls with the 613 precepts which are written therein, cursing him with excommunication with which Joshua banned Jericho, with the curse which Elisha cursed the boys, with all the castigations written in the book of law, cursed he be by day, cursed he be by night, cursed be he when he lies down, cursed be he when he rises up, Cursed be he when he goes out. Cursed be he when he comes back in. The Lord will not spare him, but the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. All the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from heaven. The Lord shall separate unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. But you that cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. So by the time we get to the end, we find out that he kind of just did at the start. At the time of the ban, uh, Spinoza hadn't even published the books that would make his name nearly synonymous uh, with the devil for centuries to come. Uh, in 1675, two years before he dies at 44, Albert Boog, a former admirer of Spinoza who converted to uh, Catholicism, wrote to Spinoza this. What's your whole philosophy but sheer illusion and fantasy? You committed, uh, commit to it, sorry, not only your peace of mind in this life, but the eternal salvation of your soul. If you don't believe in Christ, you're more wretched than I can say. So keep in mind, there's a Catholic assaulting him now, right? Before it was the Jews telling him he was the worst. Uh, but the remedy is easy, right? Repent your sins, realize the arrogance of your wretched and insane reasoning. You do not believe in Christ. Are you so bold you think you're greater than all those who have ever risen up in the state or in God's churches, uh, than the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, so on, than Lord Jesus himself? Do you alone surpass him in teaching and your way of living and in everything? Will you, wretched little man, base little earthworm, ashes, food for worms, exalt that you're better than the incarnate, infinite wisdom of the Father? Do you reckon yourself wiser and greater than all those who've ever been in God's church? On what foundation does this rash, insane, deplorable, and accursed arrogance of yours rest? So the book that probably um, brought this letter upon Spinoza is probably the Theological Political Treatise, which came out in 69 or 70 with a false publisher and without Spinoza's name on it. Although, given the way Europe worked, everyone kind of knew it was Spinoza. The treatise, in contrast to the philosophical system of the ethics that would uh, be published after his death, although he circulated copies of it uh, among friends, uh, was much more radical in my opinion. Uh, but the treatise is a critical hermeneutics or interpretation of the Bible. Spinoza's work in the treatise uh, is basically a close analysis of the Bible by way of a critical history. Who wrote the Bible? How is it consistent with itself? How does it make its claims? In content of the treatise, it doesn't say anything that's too new. Spinoza concludes that uh, Moses didn't author the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. Uh, but Hobbes had already made this point, uh, I think, about 20 years earlier. Right? And even before Hobbes, uh, who said of Spinoza once, I durst not write so boldly, right, in reference to the book, 
the issue of the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch wasn't straightforward, right? because the last chapter of the Pentateuch describes the death of Moses, so it would have been hard for Moses to write that part. Right? Uh, so I mean, people already had put it in question. Right? So Spinoza argues that there's no such thing as the chosen people, miracles and misunderstandings of natural phenomena, prophecies, no privileged form of knowledge, and the main takeaway and truth of the Bible are things we don't really need the Bible to know, which is to be nice to each other. Right? However, Spinoza notes, and this is the political, the theological political treatise, that you do need something like the word of God and the people who can hear it if you want to control and dominate people. And he got to this point uh, by way of a simple formula. And the three-word phrase that comes to inform his philosophy and in the inheritance of his thought is Dave Siva Natura, God or nature. If God and nature are the same, right, interchangeable, the same thing, then there's no beyond of nature to ponder, no divinity, no human nature, uh, no spirit to separate the races of men by rank, no transcendent reward and punishment beyond what we have here right now. In writing Deus Sib Natura, and taking that as a starting point for thinking, Spinoza consigned himself to be forever a devil haunting every philosophy that tried to hold nature apart from something else. Every metaphysics, in my reading. Right? If metaphysics is, in the Aristotelian sense, metaphysica, right? beyond nature. So in the contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, I'm turning to Marx here. Right? Uh, Marx writes that the criticism of religion is the premise of all criticism. What the critique of religion does is break the camera obscura of ideology to reveal its beings who make religion and not religion that makes beings. The critique of theology is a critique of necessity as a kind of theodicy. A critique of the idea that this world, this history, this suffering has an obscure purpose. Right? That that is just not going to fly. If the idea of necessity is shattered by critique, that things have to be this way, the illusion evaporates and we come to face, and this is scary, that the reason some starve, some live in poverty, some die in streets outside the clinic because they can't buy insulin, is not because that's how the world necessarily is, but because we are making it this way. But just as we make it this way, we can also unmake it and remake it anew. So in a little known fact that I really like, uh, when Marx was 22, he transcribed, right, made a copy of the Theological Political Treatise, uh, and some of Spinoza's letters, and he signed it Marx. Uh, perhaps he predi uh, predicted his own reception to parallel Spinoza's. Spinoza's books were immediately banned, burned, cursed, and decried as a product of satanic atheism or pantheism, depending on who you asked. Yet Spinoza continued to be read, and every so often uh, some controversy happened, right? especially in 18th century Germany, where multiple uh, German luminaries are pointing to each other and saying, you're a Spinoza's, aren't you? Right, and for some reason it would ruin, well, for reasons it would ruin your reputation. Uh, Kant ends up publishing a news article, a news article, sorry, an article in a newspaper, uh, who likely, Kant publishes an article in the newspaper, and I, by the way, I'm fairly certain Kant didn't read Spinoza, and he claims that Spinozism is dangerous because it leads to, uh, my German's horrible, and Svarmare, political enthusiasm, and in other words, Spinoza's writing, uh, is dangerous because you might read it and do something. Unlike, I'm assuming, Kant thinks his own philosophy. <laughs> so while Marx is arguably the most widely read philosopher in the world, he's typically absent from most philosophy departments in the US. Right? We had one professor who focused on Marx um, in the philosophy department here in UO, uh, but we, they went to Emory, right, leaving us with zero. Uh, the history of Angela Davis's uh, academic career provides a clue for why we don't have a lot of Marxists uh, in philosophy departments. The UC regents fired Angela Davis from UCLA's philosophy department for being a communist. Uh, and this is easily accessible because UC public records are public. Uh, a judge determined that was um, against the law, so they fired her again two years later um, using a different body of evidence. Uh, today, many University of California's philosophy departments place highly in program rankings, and they mostly focus on philosophy of mind with connections to the tradition of cognitive neuroscience. Last time I checked, at least. So, last section. Uh, in the Critique of Cynical Reason, Peter Sloterdijk writes in praise of the figure of the devil as a kinnik. The vision of the diabolical that comes over people is thus closely connected with the phenomenon of kinicism. A footnote in this section brings up Spinoza, right, the only appearance of Spinoza in this book. Um, and Sloterdijk's quoting a contemporary of Spinoza named Johannes Musaeus. This uh, Theology professor says, were not also pantheists for a long time held point blank to be worshippers of the devil? Whether among those whom the devil himself is paid to annihilate all divine and human right, someone is to be found who in this work of destruction has been more active than this swindler, 
put the emphasis a little weird, right? But Spinoza is this person. Right? Over a hundred years later, Hegel comes to teach his lectures on the history of philosophy in the same city, Jena, and he would declare that to be a philosopher, one must commence by bathing in this ether of Spinoza's divine one substance. So, as we know, Peter Sloterdijk distinguishes between uh, two different kinds of cynicism. Right? Um, the modern contemporary sense that is very smart in describing why or how things are bad. And kinicism in its Greek sense that challenges the gravity and complexity of ideas with the base materiality of the body and nature. Right? So this is from the book. Can it be called anything other than vulgar when Diogenes lets a fart fly against the platonic theory of ideas? Or is fartiness itself one of the ideas God discharged from his meditation on the genesis of the cosmos? What is it supposed to mean when this philosophizing town bum answers Plato's theory of eros by masturbating in public? It's contraposed to cynicism. Cynicism is the dull voice of de uh, the Democratic National Convention that declares the best we can do is one degree better than the presidency of Trump, and seriously and carefully presents an array of researchers, polling data, and news personalities to lay out its evidence for why nothing matters and nothing changes. In response to what Sloterdijk calls a culture in which hardened idealisms make lie into a form of living, kinicism is the province of those who are aggressive and free or shameless enough to speak the truth. So here's the thesis of this talk. To be a cursed devil, the downfall of civilization, the most evil thing, fork tongue antithesis to all that could ever be good, right? to be really just bad, the worst thing, um, requires that you describe the world simply as it is, right? without a transcendent god, subject to the violence of the greedy, and more than anything else, precisely changeable by none other than ourselves. In other words, to be called the devil is to say there are no devils, there's just us. Uh, with regard to the critique of religion, uh, I'm reminded of an account of Spanish colonialism I read. At various points in the violent colonization of the Americas, uh, reports came in that the indigenous were offered the privilege of converting to Christianity before their executions so that they'd have a place in heaven. When the indigenous people asked if the colonists would be there too, and were told yes, they rejected conversion and chose to die of heathens. For any such afterlife that included the colonists would surely be hell. Thank you. So our last speaker of the day is Tobias. So Tobias Lehmann is a first year PhD student in the Department of German and Scandinavian at U of O. He graduated with a BA in History and Social Science in 2006 from the University of Erfurt, Germany. And then he was a foreign language lecturer and assistant visiting professor of German in South Korea from 2011 to 2019. He has translated and published a poetry book from Korean into German, and his talk today is titled The Sublime Gesture of Authority, Cynicisms in Theodore Adorno's Negative Dialectics. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, I will present about Theodore Adorno's Negative Dialectic, which was a former research project, and I will concentrate on the main ideas of the, of the Adorno, his main arguments and the methodolo methodological status of his critical interpretation of non-identity. So the collapse of identity so he falsifies somehow Marx, who we talked before, um, in his negative dialectic. So his approach and argument, so the theme of his issue is non-identity and has several multifaceted meanings. It tries to reconcile different approaches of dialectic. So it's an exploration of those topics that shows that negative dialectic intersects with substantive doctrines, including a version of transcendentalism and a claim about deformation. So deformation is actually that what he understands on the collapse of uh, dialectics. And the peculiar methodological status of negative dialectic explains that in my major argument of the negative in, uh, dialectic includes that Adorno's transcendentalism makes some sense of the aforement, aforementioned deformation claim. Right? So it explains how deformation is constructed, is configured. So Adorno's first strategy um, in his negative dialectic is to radicalize Western philosophy. So actually, it's two strategies. Yeah. The radicalizing of Western philosophy is somehow identical to the, the title of his book, Neg Negative Dialectic in German or Negative Dialectics. It was written with explicit aim of radicalizing Western philosophy as a whole. 
yeah, as a coherent philosophy by producing what he termed non-identity thinking. So he tried to construct the opposite of identity by collapsing identity. Yeah? That's the second strategy. So Adorno takes Hegel's dialectic to aim at establishing the identity of concepts with being by collapsing everything on the side of concepts on the one hand, and on the other hand by collapsing everything on the side of being. So the two different kinds of collapsings of identity, which he calls at the end non-identity configuration. Negative dialectic aims to preserve the non-identity of concepts and being by insisting on the irreducible non-conceptual kernel at the heart of concepts. There are two problems that Adorno actually develops in his negative dialectic, and they and this problem can be understood as an attempt to resolve two different problems. So first, if concepts are not identical with their objects, then they are inadequate to the task of defining objects. So first, and the second, if we are aware of this, but accept that philosophy has no other resource for understanding and defining objects except this concept, then we have to find out how to create an adequate form of philosophy using means we know to be inadequate. Yeah? So concepts cannot be identical with objects by definition. This is. And so this isn't simply a problem of a poorly conceived concept that should be replaced by creating a better concept. But the problem is exacerbated by the fact that both concepts and objects change over time. So, thus every concept has a history and is embedded within history. That means embedded in the temporality of history. So, Adorno's solution, so he provides a solution of this twofold problem of these two strategies. This is to build a critique of concepts into a critique of philosophy. So, twofolded critique, if you want to say so. Yeah. So, that's why he falsifies dialectics. Since this is a working with a fundamental problem of the inappropriateness of concepts, it is described as negative dialectic. That is to say, it's a restless form of thinking an ongoing form of thinking which does not proceed from or expect to arrive at a certain point at a transcendental or transcendent ground or principle. Yeah. Negative dialectic directs philosophy to confront the interfaces between concepts, objects, ideas, and the material world. So it's a confrontation of different concepts and the construction of opposition, of negative oppositions. So. He questions the traditional dialectics. Yeah? He takes traditional dialectics to consist in the subordination of particularity in the universe. So I provide an example uh, in the material world. For example, perception of a wooden object of a particular color and a particular shape in a particular spatial and temporal location is subordinated to the concept table. Yeah? So the wooden object is subordinated to the concept of table, which is a universal concept. Yeah? So, yeah, this is only an example. Yeah? The wooden object is only an example. It can, it can be it's interchangeable. So you can interchange uh, this wooden object to, to, to the universal concept of table at any time with other examples. So the same works with capitalism. Yeah? This is what is interesting. This is the way how he criticizes capitalism in a different fashion from Marx. So he thinks capitalism reproduces the subordination at a different level. Yeah? That means that the individuality is subordinated to capitalism. The same as the wooden object is subordinated to the table, which is universal. So capitalism eradicates individuality. It makes everyone interchangeable with everyone else. You know? So in Germany we would say Gleichmachung, homogenization of the individuality. In dialectic of enlightenment, Adorno and Horkheimer put it like that. Abstraction, the instrument of enlightenment, stands in the same relationship to objects as fate, whose concept it eradicates as liquidation. Under the leveling rule of abstraction, which makes everything in nature repeatable and of industry, for which abstraction repairs the way, the liberated finally themselves becomes the head, which Hegel identified as the outcome of enlightenment. So can draw the conclusion, negative dialectic insists on preserving particularity. So whatever in the particular can be, cannot be subordinated to the universal, 
testifies to the falsity of the new version. Right? In our case, we, we, the wooden object was possible, it was possible to subordinate the wooden object to the universal table. But if it is not possible to subordinate this object, then it falsifies the universal. And the same applies to capitalism. Non-conceptual particulars both make concepts possible and reveal the falsity of the conceptual. So then, and this is how he derives this, his concept of non-identity. So the non-identity of concepts and particulars is the truth, in his opinion, that constantly bubbles up despite the claims of traditional dialectics to understand the grasp of the particular by means of concepts. Negative dialectic is meant to grasp this truth. But since this truth cannot be grasped by submitting it to concepts, yeah, because concepts are falsified, the technique of negative dialectics is to submit traditional dialectics to immanent critiques. This is ongoing process, this never-ending process of critiquing or criticizing uh, concepts. Negative criticizing. And this shows the gaps in traditional dialectics where claims to knowledge are based on the disavowal of an identity. One other thing is that Adorno is concerned with the structural components of things, or to put it otherwise, the efficacy or capacity of the form of objects to the extent that they impose limits on what can be done. So they impose limits, intrinsic and extrinsic limits on objects. For instance, in looking at any given piece of technology, yeah, Adorno would look at it di dialectically and suggest that it's only by way of its own contradiction that you come to understand. So any technology which will develop or which is new to the society can only be understood by contradicting yeah, this with other items, yeah, by contradicting this with society. This is the way actually Adorno criticizes the, social, the society. This is the first form of social critics, to contradict things. A hammer and a sickle, for example, may be used both for production and well for bashing fascists as well. Yeah. So he is interested in the circumstances yeah, and what tools you can use to criticize certain dictatorships in this case, for example. So, my look on Adorno. In practice, one way to look at Adorno's work is to see him as a kind of seer or guardian of the past. He takes a look at the history, and he's very interested in his history because of his own legacy of national socialism, and pinpoints those aspects of Syrian culture which he finds detestable. Yeah. So one of the uh, uh, main proposals of the Frankfurt School where uh, Adorno belonged to was uh, to criticize totalitarianism and authoritarianism to find out the roots of these things. Yeah, and this, uh, this uh, theory of contradicting of negative dialectics which he developed at the end of his academic research was one tool to finalize this research. He then targets them specifically, going all out to burn those bridges so that they don't ever reappear again. So, and, well, we, can, we may also relate Adorno to Nietzsche, for example, so he was well tuned to music and saw these thoughts of notes as disharmonies, the same as Nietzsche uh, considered rhythm and rhymes as sorts of his disharmonies, maybe. So that's it. Thank you very much for your consideration. <laughs>
uh, I, my question is uh, actually the another aspect of uh, uh, this uh, adjunct position. Um, I, I would say there are two types of systems. So the adjunct and the, and the say administrator is the one type of uh, interaction. Uh, it makes them say less uh, say less powerful because they are subject to. On one hand, they are I mean they don't have the the status to to guarantee they are say they can say what I mean whatever they think is correct or the uh, and uh, the, the administrator almost can dispose them at any at, at will. Okay, but another side is the issue is. Uh, how they interact with the student, particularly, I would say, unfortunately, at uh, certain type of universities, the students are very, how to say, it, they have the power to punish adjunct because the, they can use the uh, so-called teaching evaluations. Sometimes, mo most often, it's not because the adjunct had a poor teaching skill, but because students don't understand the material. More often, because the, the material are challenging such as, for example, statistics or research method they hate, but they transfer or they blame the teacher for their own incompetence. So in that situation, uh, of course, when they put the adjunct in, a, I mean, almost double jeopardy in a sense, okay, unfortunately, they, so they, student can punish them too. So when you say the, the when they share their uh, stories, they, they, are, they are vulnerable they, because they have no power, could some student actually take advantage of that they are not only they lack sympathy. Say some students actually use they are see the person as more some, somehow uh, less qualified because they think they have more power, and because they some students I, I, I would say of course I cannot say everybody, but the certain portion students they want to just pass by. They don't care what they learn. They want to get C, C plus that enough. Okay, they don't care about what the material they learn. So how to you I mean in the sense. Describe this situation, the dynamic in the more, I mean, the higher level in the sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, if, I, if I might be permitted to cuss, it's kind of fucked up <laughs> the situation adjuncts find ourselves in. Um, because these risks are run from all over. Um, I will say also that it's such as a matter of, of um, student perception of the teacher that, and I'm sure you graduate students can identify with this, even the second uh, year master's candidates. Um, how many of y'all get called doctor? Right? Yeah. We don't bother correcting that, right? We just let that slide. Um, my point here with that is that it's to some degree it's going to be a matter of student perception, anyways, of the teacher. Um, the institution itself will lend you some authority just by virtue of the fact that you're standing in front of that classroom. Um, as far as being made more vulnerable through sharing your story or building a curriculum around um, of the, from a critical pedagogical standpoint, I don't know. And that's a, it, I don't want to talk abstractly about all the education platforms because I don't, first off, I don't have the experience to say that. Um, secondly, I don't want to abstract the classroom from the lived material class itself. So I'm kind of having trouble seeing where um, okay, so maybe in your example, like in, in my composition classes or something, in the one-on-ones, um, because I don't have the uh, perceived institutional backing for on, from the student's end, that um, I'm subject to more criticism of my teaching itself, um, I would say that, that that probably signals a dysfunctional relationship with the student um, in terms of the, either the scaffolding of support isn't there for them, and it's again especially difficult for adjuncts because you just don't have the time. I mean, you might make office hours two times, two hours a week, um, but you don't have so much time to ensure that everybody's on board. Um, I can say in my particular institution that they do uh, pay attention to negative reviews. If you if you get substantial poor reviews from the students at the end of it. Um, that's an issue, but the faculty there is in such a, um, such a supportive role that I don't feel, I feel like if I'm a terrible teacher at, at this level, um, I'm not going to be fired the next. But that's a way different position than our part-time instructors, right? Um, if they have poor reviews, I, I, but again, I can't speak from that position. So um, what I do want to say is that it's, it's fundamentally important to criticize knowledge um, as not 
uh, to criticize knowledge as, as not socially constructed, as not um, produced from the material moment, um, and that there at some level has to be a risk in education. Um, so we're not dealing with the same circumstance as Paula Ferry was in it for an example of getting um, uh, banished from the countries that he had come from, the country that he had come from um, as a result of his educational practices. Um, so it's not quite that bad, but it still at some level requires putting you out the, yourself out there. Um, and I don't think I have a better response than, than that. To that? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Troy. Can I add as an ex-adjunct? Yeah. The people punishing you are not the students. It's like they have no power. It's the admins who act on that feedback. Right, that's yeah. the issue in my mind. Yeah. Very good point. Uh, any other questions in the back? Sorry, our little microphone box is deciding not to work today. So if you want to project and ask a question. Yes. I have a question about uh, the first two talks. I saw some similarities between you, and uh, you both were talking about the continuity of the educational tradition. That it's very you, you stress that it's very hard to get out of it, and I think you said also that we're all uh, shaped by the language and by the. Uh, tradition that we, are, that we have learned. So I was wondering if you had thought about, I, I missed a little bit of, of uh, a direction on how this change of the curriculum would actually translate. And so I was what the proposed change of the curriculum would translate. And so I was wondering what you do with tradition. Um, do you think it's important to continue certain things that we traditionally learn, or do we throw it all out of the window? Or how do we deal with that? Uh, to what extent actually should we adhere to, to works that everybody has learned in the past? Mary, you want to go first? That's a great question, and thank you. Um, as an English teacher, that's something that you know comes up all the time in terms of how much of the canon do you teach, and and how much do you try to be inclusive and add things that that have not been there, and people whose voices have been excluded historically. Um, I actually, I kind of want to give a shout out to a great teacher I have right now, who is Dr. Spirit Brooks, um, guest teaching from Oregon State actually, but she's a graduate of our program in CSSE. Um, the way that she is tackling that is we, we're taking qualitative methodologies, one, and she's got the traditional canon kind of laid out week by week, but each week's readings might include, here's the canon reading, and here's some other voices that are usually not cited but need to be heard, and really bringing that in not just on a, like a one-time drop-in basis, but consistently every week. So to me, that is a really, awesome way of just giving a good start to one way of starting to break out of what we've been doing. I think there are many, many, many more ways. Um, but I do think that it's been a powerful experience for everybody in that class to see, yes, you, you can prepare students for this is the canon you're going to be expected to know when you go on to the next course. However, these voices are also crucial, important, have been left out, have been marginalized, and we owe justice that work of trying to not not just tack them on but really work them in throughout does that help at all okay yeah, i think that's really smart and on point um as far as how to handle it but it, what i'm getting from your response mary is that these the works themselves whatever has been traditionally taught has to be contextualized for what it was right and ultimately that's I would argue that's what it has to be in, in uh, most every field. Now, I'm not talking about you have to dig down uh, 400 years in the past or 300 years in the past or 200. And, and rhetoric, the social turn, for example, the dominant um, theories on, on language and, and discourse, they really arose out of conversations happening first in the 40s and then later on in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, so it's relatively new. Is, is my point. Um, and now we don't have any of the, we get a little bit from what it was before, there's a little bit of classics, but at WSU, for example, there's no longer a classics department 
on campus for a reason. Um, knowledge in academia just kind of comes and goes and leaks a little bit on the way, right? Um, so uh, I think no matter what we're teaching, and it's an indirect way of answering your question, but we have to uh, frame the context for from which that's coming. We have to ground it in the circumstances from which it's produced, and we have to have um, meaningful interrogations of um, whatever is in front of you at the classroom. <laughs> and through that, then, um, that's going to apply to uh, whatever has been traditionally known um, while leaving space open meaningfully uh, for traditionally marginalized voices, if that makes sense. Um, the, the problem with part of this, too, is, is talking so abstractly about every educational situation. Um, we're not getting to look at the praxis of this and see what it looks like for a particular curriculum. Um, I, I don't, yeah, we, we probably don't have time to run through every discipline. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for joining us for our last panel. And I want to remind you guys, we're going to have coffee and cookies in the back, and we're going to have our keynote speech, which is Gods of Irony at 4? Yeah. All right. Thanks again. <laughs>